Our next talk is by Eduardo da Silva, Architecture as Enabler of Organizational Flow of Change. Thank you. Sorry for the little delay. As always, things go wrong when you are trying to start presenting. But here I am. So I'm um, very excited to be here at Kandinsky for the first time and talking about something that is a bit more abstract than previous presentations. But I think if we start looking at these sort of things, we will be able to unlock some aspects that allow us to achieve this, what I call, sustainable flow of change. So I will be talking on how can we uh, basically position architecture in organizations and also if maybe, if necessary, architects and how to use those to achieve this uh, sustainable flow of change. And I will try to, to start by motivating a bit why, why should we be thinking more about this? So wh why is it important to think about uh, sustainable flow of change? And uh, today we already heard a, a few times about that, but I find this sketch a very interesting uh, sort of visualization of to, to, to motivate that need. So if you look at this part here, uh, you see that over the last, basically since I was born, around 40 years ago, the way we started inno bringing technical innovation to, to, to our lives has just exploded. And so the markets are innovating quickly. We are expecting more and faster. However, if we look at the way we are uh, um, handling our organizations, the operating models that we use, the way we are building software, if you look, we, well, we started Agile, we have DevOps, a few things, but we still have like very hierarchical ways of deciding and controlling on how are we building this software. And that doesn't allow us to achieve this flow of change. So be able to listen to our environment, to the customers, and iterate quickly. This really hinders us. And the worst is how somehow we are bringing these innovations to the market. We are building these things, but we are paying it with something. And I believe what we are paying it with is basically stretching our organizations, our people, our teams, uh, people get burned out. Uh, we, we do a lot of that so that we can still uh, bring things to market. And even worse is that we don't just burn out our people, we are adding more complexity in the socio-technical system that we are. So we bring more people, we throw people to the problem because we think, okay, we are going to solve this because we have more people, right? Um, not really. And furthermore, as Conway's law will grant us, we are also building more complex systems. So at the end, we, we are not uh, improving this, we are even making it worse. So this looks like a, a very uh, uh, grim uh, uh, situation, but the fact is that if we continue doing this, we keep on fighting with, with our environment. The external, so we, we want to bring these innovations, but also internally, because we are building all of this unnecessary complexity. We keep on adding more people, bringing it more complex, adopting safe, adopting all sorts of things that just add even more complexity. Um, so, basically, what I sort of want you to think about is that those old-fashioned uh, organization structures that we still use, bureaucratic, uh, controlling, they are not allowing us to achieve the, the dynamics we want, to, to that modern organizations need. Because we do knowledge work, we handle complex systems, so we cannot be in control of everything. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. So what can we do? We need to start acknowledging that we cannot control everything. We need to acknowledge that we, uh, our organization is uh, an open system. I think Trond will be talking about this on the afternoon. So wh what is this? It's Basically, we are continuously being affected by our environment. Our customers are asking things. Our competitors are doing something that we need to react. And we want to affect back. 
So we need to start designing the organization and, and approaching architecture, etc., with, with this, this sort of frames. So we, we, we want to allow the organization to be able to respond uh, and also learn. So how can we learn and then bring that uh, and adapt and bring that so that later we can do better? So this is basically this idea of sustainable flow of change. So we can do this sustainably. We are not always pushing and just throwing more people and hoping for the best. And how can we do that? So w what are things that we can play with? This is like a simple mental model that I've been using for a while to reflect the, these ideas that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you today. And basically, we tend to focus too much on this. So what we, we want to do technical innovation. So we want to build a technical product. And we don't care how we get there. So we are stretching, throwing more people to, to, to the equation. And what I think we should be focusing on is to basically look at this world picture. We need to design with this world picture in mind. We need to understand, OK, uh, what's happening on our environment? What does our customer need? Uh, what are our competitors doing and we need to do something about? And our teams and our organization needs to be able, we need to think about them. Uh, like Susanna already talked a lot about today. Uh, how, how can we organize so that they can listen to the environment and can do something? They have enough cognitive load, they have an, enough uh, ability to do that. So that then they can build, but also evolve this product. Because like I try to represent here, this is not a, a one-time uh, one transformation. The environment will keep on changing, things will change, and we will need to go through this uh, indefinitely. Uh, so, why is architecture and, and possibly architects uh, an interesting thing to, to start approaching this? Um, so, as Grady Bush uh, says very uh, eloquently or very strongly on this uh, um, quote here, we always have architecture and sometimes we sort of uh, do it uh, or happens incident, uh, uh, accidentally but we can be more intentional on how we are doing this. So how can we approach architecture and how can we design our systems? Um, and I even tried to add here a little thing to, to Grady's uh, quote, which is architecture, but thinking at that more holistic picture, looking at more aspects. So roughly a, a year and something ago, um, I wrote this blog post. Uh, I think it's my most popular blog post on my website, where I started uh, um, based on an, an article from Gregor Hopi, uh, looking at like how are uh, uh, companies organizing architecture and architects, and I started looking a bit broader, like oh, maybe we can think of this uh, as sort of uh, what sort of architecture topologies do we normally have in organizations, um, and one of them on the article. I also talked about this idea of having architecture as an enabling team, uh, uh, talking about the team topologies uh, ideas. But since then, I started thinking even more about this. But, but first, let's just look at uh, those basic ideas or basic architectures that you may have on your teams, thinking about these aspects. And Gregor presented these four possible uh, architectures. So I will start on the, the rightmost side. So there are situations where architecture just happens. It's implicit. Uh, it's like inmates running on an asylum. So things are just happening. We are not thinking too much on, about architecture. There are no architects and people are just doing things. Uh, then you have some other types. Like if you are there, maybe a, a, a step towards a better situation is to actually have an architect. However, like Gregor shows here, uh, be careful with that, right? So try to see that as a stepping stone to something better, not just as a, finite, uh, a final uh, situation. So here, an architect is basically deciding and team is executing. I think most of us feel a bit weird when, this, when reading that. But this, is, this happens, right? So I probably if, uh, if I ask you, some will raise hands, this is still happening. 
But this can be a stepping stone from, say, no architecture to something slightly better, like this architect can actually be uh, coaching people on that team so they can then own architecture decision making and take decisions from a closer context. This person is doing productive work on the team, it's helping deciding better, etc. etc. But still, it's a single person doing architecture. So it's, uh, this person is deciding, the others probably are waiting. You have all sorts of dynamics that may not be still the best. So what Gregor said is, we can go into a situation where the teams are actually not, uh, there is no architect. So it's architecture without architects. So there are multiple people on the, on the team that are driving decision making or, or doing things uh, around architecture. So this, like I said, this is a, don't look at this as a sort of, okay, we don't have any architecture, we are going to uh, read this book and we will be there. No, this is a continuous, this will take time, probably months, years. So, which is also difficult sometimes for some, uh, for example, uh, leadership or ex executives to accept, oh, this is taking too long for us to, to get there. But it takes time and sometimes we bounce back that person uh, decided to move to another company and this team becomes uh, a bit uh, lost and I don't know, that architect can still play that role for a while, uh, coaching the team and then probably they can keep on improving. Cool, so we have a recipe to solve this. Um, not really, because we keep on talking just about a team and a company, it's not just one team. So what about decisions that cross multiple teams, that cross the whole company? How do we deal with those? Because organizations are, are this sort of network of, of teams and scopes of work. Um, and looking at architecture on a team in isolation, as uh, already we heard today, it may not be enough, or I, I think I would assert it's not enough. Although, this is a rather uh, um, common and, and reductionistic approach that we hear a lot. Like, hey, we, we want the team to be autonomous, so we do everything. This team should be there, we shouldn't uh, bother them. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that they are b part of a bigger, bigger picture. So we, we, I think we should start thinking about like an alternative framing, which is um, embrace that we are part of this more complex system, we, ha we are a network of systems. Um, and those interactions between teams, they, they bring a lot of value. Uh, the team needs to sort of understand, are they contributing to the purpose of the company or the product they are building? And so I would like to, to propose rephrasing the, this pure team autonomy to something more like purposeful autonomy. So we want the teams to be as autonomous as possible. That's, that's I think, a good aim. But we want them to be aligned to the purpose of what are the things that we are trying to do, right? So it shouldn't just be an island somewhere. So you will hear this two times today, uh, but I, I think it's a good thing. So the system is more than some of its parts. So we don't want just these teams to be doing their thing on their own part. We want them to figure out what should be their interrelations, their interactions. Uh, otherwise, we cannot shape the properties of that system. So a team in isolation may be doing great work, but they may be messing up the complete system. I had this experience on, I worked for five years in, in the, the biggest online, online retailer in the Netherlands. And once we had like the search team and the recommendations team on their own islands, and they were both doing the best they could, but when they were presenting things to the customer, they were conflicting with each other. And that was sort of destroying the sort of conversion rate. So they, they thought, ah, oh, we are doing the best we can here, and, uh, but they were not uh, uh, doing good enough together. So this is a good example of this sort of uh, why we should be looking at that, those, the scope of things that these teams are contributing to. Ruth Malan, on her uh, uh, workshop and her book, she doesn't call it a book, but this is a sort of a, a, an amazing book. She talks about these, these things, like how, how can we start thinking about decisions across boundaries? Uh, this is not trivial, it's, it, it's, it's more uh, 
And I think that's why probably we try to just think in isolation. But we need to bring that on and we need to start developing this leadership uh, uh, across boundaries too. And this is where architects, etc., can help out a bit or how we organize the practices we have around the architecture. So if we start adding this idea, okay, we will, may have multiple scopes of work within the organization, how could that look like? Um, and I will use an example from this company I was working uh, on, where we basically started defining scopes where teams belong to, and scopes that would allow for them to figure out, okay, are we contributing to this? But also having people that my clicker is a bit weird. So having people that are also focusing on this scope here. So teams are here, right? So we have multiple teams, the search and the recommendation team. They are both working on producing a page to the customer. And then there is people here that are also trying to figure out, like product manager, architect, whatever, that are also trying to figure out how we, uh, where are we going uh, and being part of a bigger scope. So if the company still grows more, you may need to add even extra scope. So you have teams that belong to a product, and maybe you need to add things like a, products, a product group, a group of products that are very related with each other. And you can use this to, to basically look at scaling your organization. So we always have like a system, and there are subsystems there that, that uh, um, their interrelations de define this, this system. So, those architecture topologies uh, are very interesting, but we need to start looking at, okay, how, what about uh, things across th these scopes? How are we shaping the, the, the organization? So that we can, we can sort of define this purpose, but also start looking at goals that we need to achieve. And this is the, the, the last part of, of my, my talk, uh, where I will share some ideas on like models that we can use to to approach architecture more uh, uh, holistically in, in, in the company. So that we can really go into that idea of uh, enabling a, a more sustainable flow of change. Because we are not just thinking of one team, but we are thinking, how can we do this across the whole organization? I will use this sort of uh, uh, framing, and the idea is on the left side of here, on, on, on your left side, you have like typical organizations or traits of the organizations are ones that lead to low or, or, or lower ability to, to approach, to do, to, uh, to do this flow of change. So you can also think about velocity on decision making, um, team enablement. Here we tend to have like much lower um, levels. Uh, and you tend to have, when you are too much on the left, you tend to have like a, a, an unclear approach to architecture. So things are just happening. Um, you also tend to have, so take this with a grain of salt. So this is not, uh, this is just a model again. But you tend to have like hierarchical uh, organizations uh, where any decision to be made needs to go a few levels up and then we wait and a few weeks later we get a response down. Um, so these are like bureaucratic or uh, as West, uh, Ron Westrum calls uh, even pathological. So there, there is heroes inside here that are deciding and teams are waiting for example. If you go to the other side what you have is and I think not many of us are there yet you have situations where everyone participates of architecture or drives architecture decision making. Um, this is a very important, maybe you cannot read, but decision making is close to the problems in the teams. So if you are there, there is trust and the teams are able to, to, to solve the problem. We are not um, basically having to go up and, and wait for someone and come down. Th that someone doesn't know uh, doesn't have the context, the richness of, of information that's there, close to the problem. And that leads to fast and more, uh, also more decentralized decision-making. And this decentralized, I will come to it in, in a moment, 
And this leads into what Ron Westrom also calls a generative uh, culture, which is the organization will be learning more. So you, we are, the teams are, are doing that, but this information and knowledge is spreading. And then the, we are more equipped to handle the pressures of the environment, so to keep on that fast flow of change. And this bottom part here, so there, this is all possible because everyone is sort of is and or feels empowered to actually be able to do these things. So let's look at these sort of four examples. So you see that I try to draw some very like ups and downs here because this is not a straight line. So we don't go from say no approach to architecture to there. It's not a, a ride that you do overnight. It will take us time. But I will share some like steps on the way. There will be more. Your organization probably is different, will have something different. But there are some traits that I think it are interesting for us to start putting on paper and, and talking about them more explicitly. Uh, I will be talking more about sort of this scope cross teams here, but you could generalize this sort of ideas to other scopes. So for example, these here or across the whole organization. So the first one, it's this idea of, uh, that Gregor shared, which is the implicit architecture. And, and basically, there is no architecture. Or it is, but it's, it's uh, a a accidental, as, as Grady Bush said. So what you have there? So you have things such as that no one is explicitly catering for architecture, not the team, no architect, even the, no ivory tower. So there is. And yeah, and you have some things that tend to happen here, which is, for example, working very project-based uh, uh, on a project-based manner. Uh, so the teams are not, they don't exist and sort of own uh, clear boundaries of work. Um, and decision-making tends to be sort of um, done centrally by someone. Uh, it could be a project manager, could be the boss, <laughs> whatever. Um, and some people think, okay, this is like a startup, right? Uh, not really. A, a startup probably is here. Because the startup tends to be a small group. They all uh, uh, exchange information, etc. This tends to be more like some organizations that just didn't um, implement good uh, architecture practices. Or even worse, I think that's even worse, buying into some framework that will tell them how to do things. And just wait for small increments and we will get all uh, right and 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 that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, that th this is not a good place to be so what can we do what are sorts of things that we can do we can do many things but i i highlighted two one is to do like uh, what um gregor proposed on that first shift just uh, having someone that that takes the role of architect here. So someone maybe comes in and takes the role of architect, and maybe uh, not just one, but multiple architects, because we are talking about something bigger. Um, and we start shaping what, what should be a, an approach to architecture. Again, we shouldn't be thinking about this like the last step on our evolution. That's a dangerous place to be. But it could be, it's, it's a first step that we can take. And the other part. And I think that's why I, I, I like the idea of architects thinking in a more socio-technical manner, not just about the technical innovation, but broader. What are the teams that need to be here, etc. We should start shaping some clear boundaries. So that could be one of the first activities that these people are, are doing. Gregor Hopi also has, I, I'm, it's like I'm promoting Gregor here on, <laughs> on the World Talk, but he has this nice book and he has some qu interesting quotes there. And I really like this, these, these here. So the, the architect is, is helping on sort of, uh, helping on decision making, uh, technical decision making, but they are also helping uh, sh changing the organization. So they, they are helping on bringing those structures that I was talking about, shaping the boundaries and helping on that. Uh, there is a, a transition, it, it talks about a transition. I think this is like a continuous thing. Um, and, and in a sense, these architects shouldn't be that, those ivory towers that I already mentioned, but it, it's someone that 
as Gregor says, can ride the elevator. Someone that can go and stay with the team, understand what's going there, but can also connect to, say, business strategies. What, what are we doing here? How can we bring this together? Because these are, like I said, the organization is multiple contexts, and we need to have ways of going up and down and learning from that. If we do that, we can go into something that I'm calling sort of, if we have the scope, in this case, the product scope, there is an architect there, and we have clear boundaries for our teams. The teams have a, a, the team scope has a, a clear boundaries. So we get into something more like this. So you have your teams, they, the boundaries start to become a bit clearer. The architect is working on this scope that surrounds the teams. Um, and architect is sort of driving how we are approaching architecture uh, uh, in the scope, but also across the teams. Um, so there are a few green things here, but there are also some challenges because um, the architect will become eventually a bottleneck uh, for decision making. So if we think fast flow of change uh, or, or sustainable flow of change, the architect will eventually become, um, he, he or she cannot be helping on everything that these multiple teams are doing. And there are other things, so like the red thing there, um, we are not empowering the teams close to the problems to actually uh, take decisions and, and ha use all of that rich context to decide. Um, I was in this situation, I think, eight years ago. Uh, and the organization at that moment, they appreciated a lot uh, what, we, what I was doing together with my uh, architecture colleagues. Um, however, eventually, I started feeling this pressure, like, hey, shit, we are um, making... The team cannot move, the team is waiting, and we are here going to the architecture board to decide something, and then need to come back, and all of that. So what I started doing is trying to actually uh, work closely with, this, with, with the teams and, and get them to, to decide more. So what, what are things that you can decide there and, and, and go on your own? So th those are some aspects that we can start leveraging to move forward, to, 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 to mature on how we approach architecture. So how can we get, and, and just an anecdote, so on that situation that where I was, um, they were trying safe. So my, uh, my uh, sort of uh, goodwill of coaching the team didn't work well because the safe, uh, structures or, or, or framework didn't allow uh, many of the decisions to just be taken by the team. We needed to go up and decide uh, on, on, on a board of architects. and So it, it was hindering us. If you can get rid of that and move <laughs> and do some things in your organization, you, you, you can start thinking, okay, how can we make the architect being this bottleneck for all decision making? So how can we make the architect uh, because probably there we cannot get completely rid yet of the architect. How can we make this person being more an enabler of decision making in the team? So a step forward could be to uh, basically have someone on the team uh, that, that's doing decision making, that, that's driving architecture in the scope of the team. And the architect still sits there as more like uh, across the teams and the, uh, being like the, this, this product architect here. If we start doing this, we go into something that's more like the, the, this architect across the teams become more uh, sort of an enabling architect. And then we have, say, architects in the team, which looks something like this. So the the blue lines are more like interactions of decision making across the, the teams. And then you see that some of the people in the teams are basically driving, um, they are architects, so they are driving uh, architecture. And but you also have new interactions. So these are like those what I was calling aligning and enabling. So th this architect is not taking all the decisions anymore. So he focuses on, okay, how can we help these teams on uh, for example, uh, what Suzanne also mentioned earlier, like how can this person be more like playing uh, the enabling uh, 
team from team topologies role like helping them on i, I don't know maybe uh, doing better testing or bringing some information in that uh, the that's sort of starting to emerge between these two teams and they need to pay some attention but they are not really seeing that so you can start having some of those elements uh, uh, done by this architect I think uh, that many organizations that are becoming sensitive to this problem of scaling architectures through the, the organization are moving into this uh, topology. So, but but this, is, this needs to be uh, done carefully. So we, we need to be careful on uh, this person here is mostly um, sort of enabling the teams to, to decide. Uh, he or she shouldn't be like the, the gatekeeper of decision making. Um, on this company I was working on, uh, the, the, the online retailer from the Netherlands, uh, I was working on a, um, um, I was sort of working with what we call the uh, a tech leads network. So the, we had multiple products and then we created a network of these people. And the, the goal there was how can we uh, move into this more uh, coaching role and less being the deciders and gatekeepers. I think that's very a very important thing to do when you are in this uh, topology here. And like Diana uh, Montalian also shared recently, these uh, having these, these topologies where we still have some architects uh, um, there on those scopes around the teams allows to, to connect some dots, to, to sort of Keeping, making sure that the wall, the organization, is sort of stays. Uh, 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 that there is integrity there. That we, we are keeping, making sure that we are still considering it. And we start moving into more like this facilitator of collective reasoning and decision making. So this may be very interesting to keep in mind uh, as as these people that will take that role of architect across multiple teams. However because you know I had more here, so we can, if we are there, we can start thinking, okay, what next could we explore and bring, bring forward? Um, and one of the things is, how could we make sure that the whole team is actually driving architecture and decision making? Maybe not everyone is interested in doing that, but more than one person and being this one that, that's controlling and, and the one that decides, okay, we go here and there. Um, and also, how could we get rid of this, like having to have the architect coordinating all the decision making across the teams and across scopes? What are things that we can do? So um, how can we sort of add elements that allow for a more distributed decision making and learning. Because if we start having ways that multiple teams are uh, finding ways to approach uh, architecture decision making uh, and talking with each other, learning is also going to increase. Uh, and this is where uh, Andrew uh, has been uh, sharing uh, great resources with us recently. So he wrote this article on Martin Fowler called uh, Scaling the Practice of Architecture Conversationally. So how can we start using conversations as, as a mechanism to basically achieve this last topology that I was talking about? And one of the things that he talked about there is the, the idea of advice process. And for the ones I know that some of you were in DDD Europe earlier this year, uh, he and uh, some other colleagues did a, a, an interesting experiment with us to experience this idea of uh, advice process. But j let's just quickly, and these are slides from, uh, from Andrew, uh, I asked him to use them here. Uh, so, um, so what's this idea of a, a advice process? The idea is that, well, if we have a decision, uh, uh, there is a decision to be made, uh, so we need to, to take a, a decision, we need to... So if we have someone in the middle, being this architecture on the team or being the architecture on the scope, well, eventually, this is going to be, uh, become a bottleneck again. So this will lead to frustration and delays um, and, and many other things, but I will not go even further. So what the advice process tells us is anyone can make a decision. Anyone in the team could make a decision. 
And again, let's keep in mind we need to do some work to get there. So your, our organizations need to have conditions for this to happen. And the conditions that the advice process in, imposes us is um, that before we take this decision, we must, this is not uh, optional, it's we must uh, seek advice for all affected parties. So we are changing an API, we look with the people that are using it, but also pe people with expertise on this. So people that, I don't know, we are introducing some new technology and there is someone that knows a lot about it. We bring it in and discuss with this person. And what this does, it takes us out of this central controlling part into a sort of a more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sort of uh, 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 a network. So people that are affected, they come into the decision and experts may also be uh, involved in the decision making. Um, yeah, and this sounds good, right? Um, during the, the, the keynote, when they, we had like six, seven hundred people uh, going through this exercise of experiencing what, what uh, advice process uh, is, they asked us a few things, and this was one of them. So what worries you about the advice process? And you start seeing uh, that we reply, things such as a decision-making skills, advising, giving skills, control, uh, coherence, hierarchy, all sorts of things. And this really tells us that we are still, we, we are educated on this hierarchical ways of thinking. It's not easy for us to see such a, a simple way of working and trusting each other, etc. So we still have these worries. It, it, it's not natural for us. So we need to do some work there. But then they also asked us, okay, uh, how confident are you about this? And I was very happy with this one, because given the previous, I, I thought, okay, we will be more somewhere here, but we seem actually to be more seeing that we, we should be, we, we could go more to the right side here. Um, so, and they, the last question they asked us is, okay, how could we become more confident ab about this? So how could we be more confident? What sorts of things could we bring in to help us on, on feeling more conf uh, confident on, on things, uh, things such as the advice process? And things like starting small, um, creating trust, um, transparency, these are things that people feel as things that we need to develop in order to start moving to this sort of architecture, topology, the ways of deciding. There are many others here, but so these are probably things that we need to start bringing to the way we approach architecture, but also what we need to bring in our organizations. So if this is not there underneath, we will have troubles on bringing this. If we start doing this and uh, maybe not a many of us experience this yet, um, uh, maybe we experience some, some little part of this, uh, we, we become into sort of this realm of uh, doing architecture or any, anybody doing architecture. And maybe architecture with, without almost no architect. Um, so you, you start having uh, basically now anyone is sort of driving architecture. Um, the architects may still exist and because we, we say we have this whole organization, multiple scopes of work happening, there will be productive work that needs to be done around the scopes of the teams. And the architects can focus on that. Like how can we make sure that our teams are, have the, say, the best conditions or maximum information available for them to decide? That could be the sort of work that the architect is focusing on there. Um, and also thinking about that socio-technical system evolution. So how are we moving? Do, do we need more teams? Uh, thinking along the product manager, the architect and product manager, and maybe the engineering manager, looking at all these perspectives and seeing, okay, how could we make this better? Um, and then if we bring in things such as the advice process, we, we start having this way of uh, having more distributed way of, of decision making, uh, decentralized. Um, and I think this, this point of, we, we start getting into this learning organization. Because now people that are affected are involved in the in decision making, or 
Uh, I forgot to tell that on the advice process. So the people that are involved, uh, they give their opinion, but the team that needs to take the decision, they have the final word on going for it. So they could decide to do otherwise. And this sounds weird, but if you have trust and you start building up on how to do this better, you start, uh, uh, yeah, basically l bringing all of this information in and using that to decide better. So at the end, it's not so weird, right? I leave here an orange uh, dot, which comes into the a key point. Whatever we are trying to do here, if there is no culture of trust, uh, safety, if those things are not on, on the culture of the organization, none of this will work. So that's a work we need to, to, to get uh, through. These are two books that show a few examples of companies that are doing this sort of way of working. So this is not just a, a dream, and, and some people are, are unlocking that and, and doing it. Bottom line, so this is basically, uh, these are a few discrete points on, on, on how to go on this. So we could go many other ways. Uh, there are probably things here in the middle. And this also emphasizes the fact that this is not something we do overnight. Uh, so this may this is a, a difficult call sometimes for 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 managers that want things quickly. Uh, if if we don't accept as organizations that this will take us time, months or years, uh, then we will be probably stuck somewhere, I don't know here or, and we keep on doing the same. We we don't move forward and we don't allow this flow of change that, as I saw at the beginning, maybe you still remember this drawing we need probably to start doing. Most organizations need to look for that. Otherwise, uh, competitors, the environment will, will keep on making us build uh, these uh, very uh, unhealthy socio-technical systems in our organizations. Um, yeah, and this is, this is basically it. Um, if you want to... to uh, um, so this is a topic I'm, I'm thinking and, and actually now working a lot on. So if you are interested on that, feel, feel free to reach out to me. I will be publishing the slide so you, you will see it afterwards. You have some contact information here. And I have two resources here that... Uh, so there is this GitHub repo called Architecture Topologies that I created when I wrote that article. And I will be trying to update it with all these ideas that I've been cooking since then and also asking people to to just contribute to that. And I will also be publishing a companion article of this talk, so uh, also keep, keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, and this is basically my talk. Thank you.